Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. I'm MAPERS board member Andy Hood. A copy of today's presentation can be found on the events page of the MAPERS website. The link to the handouts was also included in the reminder email sent earlier today. Please submit any questions you have for our speaker using the Q&A button in the Zoom app. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar, The Resiliency of Non-Traditional Real Estate, is sponsored and presented by Harrison Street. I will now turn you over to Melissa Brown, Vice President of Client Services and Marketing at Harrison Street, who will introduce today's speaker. And Andy, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. We really appreciate you taking time over your lunch hour to join us today. We hope that you find our presentation, The Resiliency of Non-Traditional Real Estate, to be informative and interesting. We always like this to be interactive, so we welcome your questions, which I know can be submitted via the Zoom uh, question box, which we will address at the end, but please feel free to have those, um, those come in as you have them arise. I'm pleased to be joined today um, by my colleague, Tom Aris, who's a managing director at Harrison Street, as well as the head of our research group. But before I turn the floor over to Tom, I'd like to just spend a few brief moments sharing some information on Harrison Street as it sets the greater context for what Tom will be speaking about. Tom, if you could please turn to slide two of our presentation. Thank you. Harrison Street was formed in 2005 we are actually headquartered in Chicago, so we have Midwestern roots. We're not far from, from many of you in Michigan. Um, we have invested on an exclusive basis in non-traditional real assets, but sometimes termed alternative real assets or niche real assets of a variety of terms that you may hear to describe them. But our target sectors of focus have been education, healthcare, life sciences, and storage. Since inception in 2005, we've invested in over 40 billion of assets across over 1,140 investments. As you can see from the map on this slide two that we're currently looking at, we invest in North America, primarily in the United States with some investments in Canada. And we also have a pan-European geographic focus to support our investment strategy over in Europe. In terms of relationships, they are paramount to everything that we do at Harrison Street, whether it's relationships with our investors or relationships with top tier universities and leading health systems that we work with or 50 plus best in class operating partners that we work with. Tom, if you could please flip the page to slide three. Slide three shows a timeline of Harrison Street's lifetime um, from inception to today and showcases the various investment strategies that we focus on. As it relates to real estate, we invest across the risk return spectrum, whether it's with our US Opportunistic Fund Series, which is a series of funds that's focused on delivering capital appreciation through development and other value creation type activities, or our US Core Open-Ended Fund that's focused on delivering current income through investment in stabilized properties, or our European Opportunistic Fund Series. Last but not least, we also invest in social infrastructure in an open-ended format. But above, above all else, we have exclusively focused on these non-traditional or alternative real estate types. Tom, if you could please flip to the next slide. And before, before I turn things over to, to Tom's comments, I just wanted to point out our specific investment experience in Michigan. As you saw from the first slide, the map of the United States, we invest all over the United States, um, but specific to Michigan and our various investment strategies, we've invested over 888 million in gross value across the student housing, senior housing, medical office, and life sciences sectors, representing 31 assets, 5,440 student housing beds, over half a million square feet of medical and life sciences real estate, as well as 2,180 seniors housing units. And with that, I will let Tom 
dive into his presentation and, and the overview. I'd also like to, uh, like to thank, uh, oops, like we've got some feedback. Is everybody hearing that feedback now or is it okay? Michelle, are we good with uh, people being able to hear us? Yes, Tom, it, okay. it's good. Great, great. Uh, so this is a slide I like to start with when we when we talk about our sectors. I mean, I know that most of the audience probably has some familiarity with uh, the non-traditional or the alternative sectors, but we think that these three you know categories really you know define what it is we're we're talking about, and we'll you know set the stage and underpin the discussion as I go into each of the individual asset classes and why we think they provide some unique uh, you know unique benefits for investors in terms of defensive. Uh, each one of these has a demographic element to it, which I'll get to in a, in a subsequent slide. And, you know, some of the other things, the other bullet points under the defensive sectors in terms of need-based and mission critical, they all really speak to really the fundamental nature of these alternative assets. And, and, and they characterize how they respond and have responded now through two black swan events, the GFC and then what we're what we've gone through in the past year with the pandemic. It's interesting. I just saw something this morning that, you know, here on March 11th, uh, a year ago today, is when the WHO actually declared the uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, a, a worldwide uh, you know a worldwide pandemic. So, um, you know, I think as as we we go through the presentation, I'll, I'll talk about some of our experiences through that as they relate directly to these assets. Um, this segment, these segments uh, where we invest are, are highly fragmented. The transaction size tends to be far smaller than in traditional real estate. And oftentimes we'll be doing transactions that you know, are as small as $10 million and as large as you know, 50 or $60 million, but, but far smaller than a portfolio of office buildings or industrial properties. But, and what we really do, and, and one of our primary strategies is we're buying these assets in a one, two, three, you know, asset, uh, you know, kind of transaction way. Uh, and, and that's really how we do 80% of our transactions in, in single or dual assets. But then we're creating portfolios and we're selling 80% of our sales across the firm in, in larger portfolios that are, are quite appealing to institutional investors you know, and or sovereign wealth funds. So we're creating a lot of value and we're, we're getting a portfolio premium by doing the, the tough work of aggregation. And then the final, or one of the final points in the slide is that, you know, access to these property types because of their operational intensity isn't always as easy uh, as it may be in some of the traditional real estate sectors. Uh, and then one thing I want to talk about as, as it relates to the pandemic, and I, I prefaced it a moment ago, is that we've really found that during the pandemic, as it relates to our asset classes, it's accelerated some trends that we were already seeing prior to the pandemic. And, and, and what do I mean by that? Well, disruption to these asset classes is a constant topic that we're always, uh, and a question that we're always, always, you know, answering. And whether it's online education, you know, replacing a traditional you know college experience whether it's telemedicine replacing going to the actual doctor or whether it's seniors staying at home and you know while, while many people you know prior to the pandemic had talked about these somehow disrupting or replacing we found that during the pandemic and, and we think looking forward that uh, that you know a lot of these you know ideas really haven't come to fruition and in fact when you when you're talking about online education, you know, where many people thought that it would be the answer. It really hasn't been, and kids are dying to get back to school. And I'll talk about that as, as we go through the student housing section. Uh, you know, additionally, during this, this pandemic, our assets have met real needs. They were open, and in many cases, they were providing the safest and the only option for housing and or delivering needed medical, health care, or other services, you know, during the pandemic and beyond. And then finally, in terms of rent collection, uh, we didn't really, you know, have any disruption. Most of our, uh, you know, most of our assets were, were collecting. In fact, all of them were collecting in the, the mid to high 90% range. So we're largely, you know, unaffected by, by what's occurred. Uh, 
like I said, demographics play a, a very important part of and, and underpin our investment strategy. And, and we see compelling demographics across all of our age cohorts. And, and the reason we like them is because the demographics are both measurable and predictable. And so when we're looking at shifts in broader regional population trends, things that, that impact, you know, regional, you know, types of asset investing, they really form the basis of our investment strategies and form our entire process. Uh, this chart just shows how we're investing, you know, across, you know, really all of the categories, that, uh, you know, all of the age cohorts and how that, you know, some of them are, are very substantial and certainly the, you know, the, the, the senior housing, you know, jumps out at you and everybody talks about the aging population, but that aging population is also accessing, you know, other parts of our investment portfolio, just as the, you know, the Gen Zs and the millennials are. So, you know, we, we like to, and we have, you know, extensive information on demographics and we spend a lot of time looking at it as we're, we're evaluating the risk and return metrics of, you know, each of our investments across the portfolio. Now I'm gonna go into each one of the uh, respective uh, investment classes that we invest in. And each of the, the sections will, when you, and you have the presentation, each will look a little bit like this. You know, the first one being why that, and, and then some of the points, and then, you know, some pictures to follow up. But, you know, for us, student housing, for those who aren't as familiar with it, means purpose-built off-campus student housing, which primarily occurs at large public universities, or the Power Five universities, which are the big sports conferences. So in, in Michigan, it would be, you know, the University of Michigan where we have assets, the Michigan State where we have had assets, and then some of the other schools like Central and Western Michigan. But, but all of those universities have a large enough student body, uh, you know, to make this a very viable, you know, segment for investing because most of the large public universities can effectively only house their freshman class on campus in the typical dormitories. And after that, uh, firms like ours who invest in student housing, you know, tend to step in and, and fill that very real need. And just as an example, what, what happened during the, the pandemic uh, is that many of the, the public universities closed their dorms. Uh, so to the extent that kids wanted to be on campus and, and to a large extent, they did want to be on campus. Uh, we were picking up freshmen that we hadn't had before. And, and because we were a viable alternative in those markets that, that didn't close. So providing a, a, a needed and, and very important service. So the kids, well, they weren't necessarily in classrooms. They really wanted to be at the university. So. As you, as you look at you know some of the these are what we would suggest are some of the key demand drivers you know going from the you know chart one we focus on you know public four year institutions and more specifically a subset of approximately 100 to 150 of the more than 800 public universities we do do some things at private schools but we tend to be primarily at the uh, publics chart two just talks about the benefits of a college degree and you've all seen that but that's why we don't really see any viable replacement to actually going to college because degree holders are employed at a higher rate and make more money over the, you know, kind of the, their lifespan than, than anything else uh, that, that we've seen to date. Uh, chart three, you know, is debt. We, we hear a lot about student debt, uh, but when you really kind of break it all down, you know, the average debt at a public school for a graduate is about $27,000. Uh, you know, you hear about the $100,000 debt, but that's really not typical. And in this chart, it shows that 70% of borrowers have cumulative debt of $40,000 or less. So when you really break that down uh, and, and you're going forward and you're having this college degree and you, you probably are, are, are a higher earner than those without a college degree, you know, your, your cumulative debt is often the, uh, you know, really the cost of financing a car over 10 years. So it's, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely worth it to, if you have to borrow, and frankly, a lot of kids don't borrow. And then really the final chart is talks about online penetration. And we've looked at this for, you know, the last few years as, as people have started measuring it. But as you see, you know, in the, in the chart, uh, at the power five, where we tend to, uh, tend to invest, you know, kids who are taking, and this was pre-pandemic, uh, kids who are taking fully online schedules really represent only about 3%. Really, people prefer to be in class. And, you know, if I can leave you with anything on online education, it's that we think it's a nice supplement, but not a substitute. 
So now as we get into some of the investment themes, and I've touched on a few of them already, uh, you know, the quote at the top really talks to the to the U.S. college experience. And while Melissa suggested uh, in, in her part of the presentation that, that we, you know, uh, invest also in, in the UK and in another in, in on the continent in Europe. I mean, the US college education is really quite a unique thing in the world. And what we've seen is that during the pandemic, people really want to be on campus and they want to be with their friends and they want that experience. Uh, so we, we, we firmly believe that in 2021, schools are going to open and many have already announced in-person classes. And as the, you know, the, the vaccination of the population progresses, uh, you know, we think kids will be back in schools. Uh, rent collection here was strong. Enrollment at public, you know, four-year schools in the fall of 2020 was just down slightly. And a lot of that was because international kids couldn't get back into the United States. And then the power fives, as I suggested before, many of those schools were up or had record enrollments this year uh, because those are the kind of schools that, that kids want to go to and applications for next year in this new test optional environment. Many schools no longer require an ACT or SAT score uh, have increased at some of these schools. Uh, some of the other points I talked about online, de-densification is a very interesting topic and one we're tracking closely. And, and if you recall back to your college days, you know, you'd, you'd live in these older dormitories and you might share a, a you know, a floor with, with 50, you know, other students and a bathroom with that many students. And in this new socially uh, distant, you know, environment that we live in, we think that may change a little bit and, and definitely generate some demand uh, to the off-campus market because, you know, our properties, and I didn't go into it in great detail, tend to be socially distant by their nature. I mean, a typical purpose-built student housing property has something we call bed-bath parity. So each student within a three-bedroom suite typically gets their own bedroom and own bathroom, and it's locked off from the greater suite. And then as we're leasing those properties, we're doing that lease directly with the student. Their parents are guaranteeing it. So if one of the kids uh, leaves or, or isn't able to pay, it doesn't affect the others. So it really makes for a nice credit portfolio and a diversified credit portfolio within the entire student housing investment, you know, environment and our collections there, you know, our, our bad debt is extremely low. It's, you know, it's less than a couple of percentage points. Uh, a couple of the last points on the slide is that, you know, the balance sheets of universities have been severely impacted. We also do some investing in on-campus where we'll do long-term ground leases with schools. And uh, we think that will be a, a real opportunity going forward as, as schools, you know, effectively outsource the student housing to folks like us. And then finally, my last point, you know, really goes to our, our investment thesis. You know, several public universities, selective public universities, and, and when you're thinking about the Michigan example, it's Michigan and Michigan State, you know, they're what we call enrollment takers. Whenever they decide they want to take enrollment from other schools, they can they can clearly do that. And we think those prevent really great present really great environments for investing. And then of course, uh, I've got a few pictures here. I mean, this isn't your uh, your, your student housing of, of 10 or 15 years ago, but this is really what it looks like now across uh, you know, much of our portfolio. And, and I think what's interesting to point out, you know, and, and here you see some amazing lounges and swimming pools and palm trees, uh, but what we think is, is, and what we see has really resonated is that you know if you look in the bottom left hand corner are these these group study rooms and these live work and play environments you know that that exist within our student housing communities have been especially important during you know during the pandemic so that kids kids will 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 have these group study sessions and, and they've really as as we're designing new properties and going forward it's something that we've added to uh, to many of them because we find you know great demand for it well there's clearly demand for the pools. The, the group study rooms uh, are, are definitely something that people are interested in. In addition to all the other, in addition to all the other amenities, which include fitness centers and you know places to gather, uh, so I think that gives you a pretty good sense of the uh, the purpose built student housing business. We also compete in uh, senior housing, uh, and this uh, this segment is really driven by prevailing demographic trends, coupled with what are medically need-based services, which really drive demand in the sector. So even with COVID-19, you know, 
as we've seen, many seniors can't live in their homes alone without assistance. Seniors have have sought, uh, you know, our our senior housing because it really provides a uh, you know a safe environment. So, as you look at uh, you know the the demand drivers, clearly population's a, a demand driver, and, and and that's a pretty obvious one, and it's growing, you know, quite substantially over the next uh, the next several decades. Um, but but we take it even deeper. I mean, we look at it by income segment. Uh, so if you look at the next chart, you know, we're tracking, you know, the uh, the income and, and the ability for seniors to afford and, and you know, afford the uh, the senior housing. And I think what's interesting to note here is that, you know, senior housing is not insurance covered. So it's all what we call private pay. So it's something that that seniors and or their families have to save for, you know, as as they uh as the, as they reach you know their 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 late seventies and, and and in many cases their early eighties, you know and, and if you've you've probably seen the you know the ads over time where it shows a very active, you know you know senior population in their their sixties and seventies. Well, those folks aren't the kind of people that are that are going into senior housing. We're really seeing that our average entry age is in the you know the seventy and and, and you know an eighty year old range. So they're they're entering a lot later. They've got a lot more needs. And they really need to be in our communities. And, and the, the kind of services that we deliver in our communities, we, we call it a continuum of care. So uh, someone might enter in the independent living, uh, you know, kind of segment of, of senior housing where they can still do a lot of things on their own, but they're in a community and they're no longer in their, their house and they have minimal medical care. But then within the community, they can also move to a higher level of what we call acuity, where they have more needs. So, you know, an, an independent living person might come in in their early 80s, but as they age, they might find it difficult to, you know, get dressed, eat by themselves, you know, provide, uh, you know, some of their medication and, you know, actually, you know, if they have to, to take some pills or do some different things during the day. So that's when they move into the assisted living category and we provide more health services to that group. And then even within the same community to the extent that you know, early stage dementia or even Alzheimer's you know, occurs, they can then, you know, that same resident who might start might have started as an independent living resident can roll into you know, and roll through both the assisted living segment and into a memory care segment within the same community and or with their spouse in the same community. So they've got that continuum of care. Uh, a couple of these other, uh, you know, these other slides talk about how, you know, typically, you know, home equity is, is basically at an all time high in the United States and, and seniors have a lot of it and that's how they're funding their stays. And then life expectancy, uh, you know, continues to rise, which is certainly helpful and a demand driver. Uh, as I get into some of the investment themes for senior housing, uh, you know, the, the top quote, it will continue to provide a range of unique and innovative long-term care solutions to this growing population of seniors is, is a very important, you know, part of our investment thesis and really underpins it because we are providing, you know, needed services, you know, to the senior population. So, you know, during COVID, uh, you know, as I'm sure you, you've all heard, uh, you know, this was the most vulnerable population. And at the early stages of COVID, uh, you know, seniors were, were probably more impacted. Uh, now, we don't participate in a, in a part of the senior housing continuum called skilled nursing. Skilled nursing versus senior housing is, is usually where, you know, people are confined to a bed, you know, they're not in an active community. And, and frankly, that's where a lot of the, uh, a lot of the deaths occurred. We, we did experience some as well. Uh, but, you know, but I'm happy to report that now, you know, we've actually run uh, in community clinics to benefit residents and our portfolio, you know, has a vaccination rate of, the, it was 86 when we did this, but now it's kind of in the 90% range. So, you know, to a large extent, a lot of that risk, you know, in terms of, of seniors being impacted by COVID-19 in our communities, you know, has been alleviated through the, uh, you know, through the vaccination process. And, you know, our, our operating teams at our properties just did a, uh, you know, a tremendous job, you know, reacting quickly to this uh, and, and really making these environments safe. Uh, you know, rent collection here is, has been quite high uh, because, you know, the, the, you know, the properties continue to operate. Uh, and then some of these other points I've covered, you know, the, you know, there's, there's great predictable demographics, seniors are prepared, uh, 
and while demand slowed during uh, during COVID, uh, you know, we saw some of our highest absorption ever prior to. So we're, uh, you know, we're looking for that demand to, to, to continue. And it's starting to, uh, people are starting to, to feel comfortable, you know, again, now that, that people have been vaccinated and, and they're starting to enter these properties again. And then really the final point is that, you know, as I talked about disruption earlier, there really aren't great, you know, alternative solutions here. If anybody's ever cared for a parent at home, uh, you know, it's just a really tough and, 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 you know, all encompassing task. And then, you know, that, and, and oftentimes adult children live in different, you know, different places than their parents. So that's not a great solution. Then home health care, you know, where people actually come into your house also wasn't a great solution because it really didn't solve a lot of the safety issues. So in general, you know, we're really, uh, we're really looking forward to, uh, you know, to this, you know, vaccination, you know, taking taking you know place in, in a lot of the senior population because we think the growth prospects here you know over the next decade are, are absolutely compelling and here's some views of the properties they actually look a lot more like resort properties and in some cases we don't have any interior views here but they uh they also uh you know look in some respects like our senior housing they have pools and they have amenities and you know there's everything that the senior needs uh, you know within the properties to uh you know, to be able to, to, to live a really great and active life. Healthcare delivery. Uh, we often uh, hear this referred to as, as medical office and, and certainly medical office is a component of this for us, but this segment for us spans what we would call on hospital campus locations and off campus locations. And our tenants typically have an affiliation with a leading health system in the market. And uses range from you know kind of typical medical offices to imaging facilities, diagnostic centers, cancer care, uh, inpatient rehab, urgent care, really anything that can be delivered outside of the hospital. Some of the things that are driving demand here are you know just national health expenditures, which the United States are virtually higher than than any other country in the world. And with limited resources, you know, every health system is looking at how they can deliver more services at a lower cost and provide a better value. So that's really kind of something that underpins the investment thesis here. And most of our properties are, are you know, kind of off campus, out of hospital, and they deliver on that, you know, kind of value and price continuum. The second chart, show, in, you know, the outpatient revenue chart shows how, how these services are really, you know, moving outside of the hospital as opposed to being inside of the hospital. And, you know, it used to be that you'd go to the main hospital and you'd, you could do physical therapy, you could see your doctor there, you could, you could do any number of services. And now, and now because of, of cost and value and consumer preference, those, uh, those services are moving outside of the hospital. Uh, you know, if you look at the next chart, older age drives visits, certainly older people use uh, the health system more and, you know, the, uh, the aging population is a, is a demand driver and a tailwind to that. Then behavioral health, you know, for us is kind of a newer area we're looking at within this healthcare delivery segment. Uh, and it's, you know, it's addiction treatment, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's all kinds of things that fall under the behavioral health you know, moniker and, uh, you know, especially as we're seeing during the pandemic, there, there's great need for this. And, you know, the Affordable Care Act really helped drive some demand in this category was it because it started making a lot of these services covered by insurance where previously people had been paying for them out of pocket. As, as we think about some of the, you know, investment uh, themes that, that drive this healthcare delivery segment, you'll see I've got a COVID, you know, 19 in each one of it in each one of these slides, you know, this healthcare delivery really maintained its resilience because all these health, most of the healthcare functions other than things like, you know, maybe physical therapy or plastic surgery or some of the less, you know, essential things, you know, continued operating and, and needed to. Uh, rent collection, you know, continued. As I was talking about this move to off campus, this trend continues and is accelerating as consumers really want retail like locations. And if, if you all think about, you know, kind of how healthcare is delivered where you are, you know, you see more of these, you know, doctor offices, imaging facilities, and places to access healthcare, you know, within your neighborhood, within an old you know, shopping center location. 
and it's really great because it's easy to park uh, and, and consumers really like it and prefer it. And they don't, you know, they'll go to the hospital for a really serious thing, but to a large extent, you know, you can do day surgeries and all these things now outside of the typical hospital setting. Uh, we typically are partnering with top health systems, you know, the, the winners in, the, in this highly competitive healthcare industry, uh, because they underpin our, our leases and, and, and tenant credits. So uh, we, we, look to, uh, we look to work with those health systems. But the, but the interesting thing is there's some in every market. So, you know, as you go back to, uh, you know, some of the slides we showed earlier, we really have, you know, uh, healthcare delivery and investments across the United States. Uh, Technology has really helped, you know, move to this out of hospital, you know, environment that we're seeing, you know, the fact that you can now do a surgery and, and have a full surgical suite, you know, outside of a typical hospital wouldn't have been even considered 10 or 15 years ago, but now it's, it's really how things are happening. And then as technology, you know, continues to, uh, to increase, there'll be even more things done in an outpatient setting. Uh, and then finally, you know, value-based care, which I, I touched on, uh, it, it, it'll continue to be more important as, you know, the, the United States and health insurers and everybody in this whole spectrum, you know, continues to, to look for ways to deliver more care to an aging population at a, uh, at a better value. Uh, here's what some of the, uh, you know, kind of medical office and healthcare delivery projects look like now, you know, they look like they're very, you know, they're, they're very attractive. They're, they're built to today's needs. They're built to accommodate patients. Uh, and then, you know, and all of these are kind of outside of the typical large, you know, in city, you know, hospital setting. Life sciences uh, is a, uh, a newer sector for us. And it operates, as we would suggest, at the intersection of healthcare, education, and the sciences. And many of the life sciences investments are typically located in what we would suggest are, are called leading life science clusters. So the big clusters in the United States are Cambridge, Mass., uh, South San Francisco, and San Diego, and to a lesser extent, uh, the Research Triangle, you know, Philadelphia, Seattle, parts of Los Angeles, uh, and other places. And in fact, you know, a lot of this life science activity occurs in, in or near university markets or in or near where talent is. And we've recently invested in a, uh, you know, a, uh, it's life science and it's tech. It's, it's, it's this very interesting, uh, interesting building that, that we uh, are doing in, uh, in Grand Rapids in conjunction with Michigan State University. So there's a bunch of different applications in there. And, and the reason it's there is because there's talent uh, in the area from all the different universities. And there's a real need for, for that kind of stuff to allow universities to break out some of their technology and then commercialize it. So when we look at uh, you know, what's driving demand here, uh, you know, certainly the, the pandemic uh, helps us to, you know, kind of inform our, our, our thinking there. And, you know, without the United States having this kind of vibrant and ongoing life sciences, you know, environment, which was quickly able to pivot to, you know, working on a vaccine and delivering it in, you know, effectively less than a year, uh, you know, it's just amazing, it, frankly, amazing to me that it was all able to happen that quickly. But it's because of, you know, all of the things that are on, you know, this page and some of the things I'll talk about on the subsequent page. But, and it really starts with funding, you know, both funding from the National Institutes for Health, which is funding the basic science that is coming out of labs. And then it's corporate venture capital and regular venture capital that's commercializing and allowing these high growth companies, you know, to, to operate and thrive in all of these cluster markets and, and many other places as well. Uh, some of the reasons why we like it is, uh, you know, when you look at some of these pharma companies and life sciences companies as they're out there in the market looking for space, the, the typical MO is that they raise money through the NIH or they go public and all of a sudden, you know, they're trying to, to quickly move through their clinical trials and, and commercialize a, uh, a drug or a therapy. So for them, rent's not a very big consideration. It's really, you know, how quickly can I, can I get this lab space and how quickly can I, can I get my, uh, can I get my, uh, my, you know, my idea to market. So, um, uh, it's nice. It gives us some pricing power there. And then as, as you look at some of these other, you know, NIH funding is not just in those big, big 
cluster markets, but really every every large university is getting some element of NIH funding, and they're all seeing how valuable it is uh, to commercialize some of this because it helps the university, but then it's creating these great ecosystems in universities where people can and, and are doing very actively commercializing you know, all of these different things across the life sciences spectrum. And then, you know, the final one is that same story NOI growth has been great and will continue to be great, you know, from a real estate investment perspective. As we think about, you know, some of the themes that, that we talk about in life sciences, you know, and, and uh, it remained fully operational and was really highlighted during the pandemic. As I talked about, rent collection was great. Uh, you know, why life sciences in general? Well, chronic disease treatment accounts for 80% of healthcare costs and anything that, you know, pharmaceutical or, you know, therapeutical companies can do to increase that spent, you know, increase uh, the, the money spent on, you know, therapies and decrease the amount of money spent on this chronic, you know, care that we're doing, you know, for diabetes, high blood pressure, cancer, uh, really helps the whole value healthcare argument, which kind of goes back to some of the things I talked about in healthcare delivery uh, markets. It's really occurring everywhere. And then in terms of, you know, capital, it's, it, you know, this sector has been so vibrant. Right now, there's, there's more demand than, than, than there is space. And across our portfolio, we're converting old office buildings and cluster markets. We're even doing some speculative building because people don't typically invest until they can, you know, kind of see it and touch it. It's probably one of the few areas that, you know, speculative development's happening. But, you know, we, we, we did one of these speculative developments, you know, two years ago, and we, we recently sold it in December, uh, you know, fully leased and, and, you know, to a great, you know, institutional buyer uh, because the appetite for these fully leased life science buildings that, that we're creating through some of our funds just right now seems to be insatiable. And I think, you know, the government impact, you know, can't be, you know, can't be discounted here because, you know, through the CARES Act and Operation Warp Speed and NIH funding, and then an expedited drug approval process has really helped the sector. And I mean, I think the, you know, the U.S. government, you know, people are usually saying, yeah, the government's always in the way. But I think, you know, here in, in this situation, you know, it really helped drive, you know, what's what's occurring today. And I think will will in the future as well. And, you know, and we pay attention to, to regulatory across all of the, the sectors where it impacts education, healthcare, life sciences, because it's a, an important part of informing our investment thesis as we go forward. You know, and here's some some pictures of, you know, some of these these great life science buildings. And to a large extent, they look exactly like office buildings and they they have components of office lab and everything. And, and when they're located, you know, you know, on or near a university in one of these clusters, it's important that doctors and scientists can, you know, they can teach in the morning, they can see patients and then they can quickly you know, get to their lab to, to work on the things that they're doing for the, uh, you know, the commercialization process. Self-storage. Uh, it's a great, uh, it's a great category for us. You know, most of you know what, uh, you know, what self-storage is. And for us, it spans all markets and demographic segments. And, you know, demand occurs really based on what we call recurring life events that are supported by population transitions, people moving, people downsizing, uh, commercial activity, people using self-storage as, you know, kind of a, a short-term warehouse or, you know, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, and has really been helped as well by a shift away as we've seen from home ownership because Americans love to have stuff and they put it in self-storage. Uh, so as you can see in terms of demand drivers here, it's used by all age cohorts, kind of depends where you are stage of life uh, length of stay expectation is really interesting for us. Most people come into self-storage and, and the way it works, I, I, sh I shouldn't have glossed over that. You know, you typically you can do the whole transaction effectively online now, but you go to a self-storage facility, you lease the space effectively on a month to month basis. They take your credit card and then they just debit your credit card every month. But, uh, many of our people come into us and say, okay, I just need this for a couple of months. And as you can see from the chart, they end up staying for, you know, months or years, uh, just because they don't really have any place to, to put their stuff. And we've done some interesting research and, you know, storage is a lot more penetrated 
uh, Michigan's not a good example because Michigan and, and Illinois and Wisconsin, people have basements. But when you think about it, people in the South and Florida and Texas and California, to a large extent, they don't have basements. So those places have a greater, you know, and when you think about your own basement, all the stuff you have there, those places that don't have basements have a greater need for self-storage. Uh, Move-in rent growth has rallied. It slowed a bit during the pandemic, but you know this category has been so resilient over time, and it just always seems to be needed. That uh, you know we've seen great demand picking up again. And then as as we look at it, uh, there's effectively no capex here. You know when when there's tenant turnover, it's basically broom sweep the space, and the next person's ready to go in. And you know this NOI versus capex chart uh, really shows the resilience and the strength of this category. Uh, as I mentioned just briefly, uh, you know, in the aftermath of the GIC, GFC, the sector experienced, you know, one year of, of negative NOI growth before entering, a, you know, a run of eight straight years of above average growth. And it, it went down a little bit in the beginning of the pandemic, but it's starting to, uh, to rally again and hit, you know, kind of record, you know, record rent growth again and, and record move in as, as people get back to uh, their ordinary, ordinary lives. Uh, as I mentioned, it's basically become a contactless business. There's typically one person at the facility. It's keypad entry. Uh, and I think it's interesting, as I talked about, too, because it's, uh, uh, you know, month to month lease, leases. I mean, you know, this and, 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 and we, you know, I, I should have mentioned it earlier, but, you know, in, in times of, of inflation, because so much of our, our, our portfolio is done with individuals in terms of, you know, student housing, uh, senior housing, and, uh, and self-storage, we have the ability to quickly reprice. Whereas if you have a five-year or 10-year, you know, industrial or office or retail lease, you're kind of stuck there. But that gives us an interesting advantage uh, in potentially inflationary times. I mean, rent collection here was very high. I talked a little bit about performance. Uh, you know, demand, we, we, we saw a different kind of demand this time in COVID, uh, you know, uh, as schools closed abruptly, you know, kids needed to put their stuff places. Uh, and as home sales surged and people exited cities and went to the suburbs, we also saw some, some increases in demand in certain places. So, you know, with storage, you never really know where it's going to come from, but based on our experience, it just kind of always always finds ways to uh, you know deliver those services to people to to store their goods uh, you know it's got healthy demographic and and structural drivers uh, you know as we've seen demonstrated by the uh, by the the quick recovery I showed on the uh, on the previous chart and you know just to to show you some of these self-storage properties, you know, people mostly think that they're in these old warehouse parks and they look pretty ugly and, and many of them are, but, but now as this, this industry has really kind of grown up, these are very attractive buildings and inflow infill locations, uh, you know, and, and, you know, the kind of places that you don't mind going to and that are nearby where people live. So, uh, that is, uh, oh, we're going to talk about data centers too. Great. Uh, so data centers is a relatively uh, new phenomena for us. You know, data centers are where, uh, obviously, you know, all of this data that we're creating is, is, is stored and, you know, they really exist all over the, uh, all over the United States. And, you know, we've been investing in this category for, you know, several years now. And, you know, this chart that shows, you know, kind of where the demand is with data centers and, and just where it, you know, the, the need for data is just growing exponentially. You know, when you think about all the things people are streaming, you know, from, you know, Netflix to Amazon Prime to, you know, even watching TV now on, on people's, you know, people's phones and, and, and streaming all that to Internet of Things to, you know, electric cars. I mean, the, 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 the demand for data is, is insatiable and it's just growing, as you can see, exponentially. Uh, you know, in this uh, in this chart. Now, when we when we talk about some of the investment themes for uh, for data centers, and I think it was, you know, probably again no uh, no better example than what we just just experienced, as everybody you know or many people you know had to pivot, begin working at home, you know, the ability to uh, you know to do all the things that we needed to do, uh, and, and also deliver mission critical, uh, you know, services and, 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 and data storage in today's digital world just can't be, 
you know, you, you, you can't talk about it enough. I mean, that's why we're so excited about this, uh, about this category. Uh, you know, it still remains a bit of a niche sector. Um, you know, we've gotten into it. We hired a, uh, a data center team to, to help us specifically with this. So we have someone now who's been doing transactions for us, you know, for about the last year who, who'd been in the sector, you know, for a long time. Um, and because it has some, some very specific, uh, you know, characteristics, high barriers to entry, and it's, it's a little bit, uh, there's a little bit of a complexity level to it uh, if, you, uh, if you haven't been in it before. But, you know, we like it because it's, it's defensive, it's got low correlation. Uh, you know, some of these data centers that we've been investing in have, you know, monopoly-like characteristics because the switching costs and the network effects of being all together are just so significant that, uh, you know, these have become very, uh, very highly sought after assets. And, uh, you know, it just presents a very compelling uh, return opportunity because, you know, we don't see this this need for data or this need for, for storing it either in data centers or in the cloud changing uh, anytime in the near future. Uh, now, now the pictures here are pretty interesting. So typically a data center, you know, you, you wouldn't even know it's there. Uh, you know, the newer ones are built in, uh, uh, you know, kind of warehouse like, you know, buildings and they don't advertise them a lot because they're concerned about security. So you could drive right by them and not know them. Now the pictures we have here are, are a different class of data center. They're called carrier hotels. And in many cities in the country, uh, these, these are older office buildings and they used to have all the, uh, you know, the, the telecommunication lines go into them. And then the, the, now, now the internet interconnects are going in there. So these are the kind of places where people want to be because of the network effects. So there's also data centers in here, but because of, you know, proximity to, to internet connections, uh, and this network effect where, you know, you kind of almost have to be there. These are where some of the data centers that we've recently uh, invested in are, are occurring. So, you know, just in terms of, you know, going forward on, uh, on data centers, we think the category is very interesting. It's, uh, it's, it's highly defensive and, and continues to grow both here, uh, you know, and outside of the United States. So that concludes my presentation. I went through quickly and I think now we'd be, uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions. And I, and I thank you again for your time. Hey, Tom, I think we've got a couple questions here. Okay. So we'll start with how can rising interest rates or inflation impact these areas? Well, I think I, I touched upon it a little bit. Uh, you know, we think we're fairly well positioned, you know, from an inflationary perspective, uh, because we have the ability to reprice. Uh, so I think that helps us relative to, uh, to some of the other segments. And then interest rates, uh, you know, they have risen a little bit, you know, clearly. And, uh, but, uh, you know, from what we're, for, at least from what I'm seeing and hearing, I, you know, I don't know that they're going to, you know, rise that much further. But, but clearly, if they do, it it impacts our, you know, our ability in some cases to transact and might require some level of repricing. But, uh, uh, you know, we we think they they may be stable for for a little while here. Melissa, I don't know if you have any uh, any comments on that. No, no other comments. What well, well said, thanks, Tom. Okay, okay. Okay, another question for you here. Um, how do you see this as a, a portion or a, in, in relation to an entire real estate portfolio? Do you see these uh, non-traditional as being a small component, larger component? Uh, I mean, I think they're, they're definitely a, uh, a portion. I don't know about small or larger. I mean, I think it depends on, you know, someone's, uh, you know, someone's, you know, kind of preference for for risk and return. Uh, but 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 I think as you you know as as you look at some of the things we do in there, you know, as you can see, we're across a bunch of different asset classes within this alternative sector. Uh, you know, they've, they've delivered some superior performance, you know, over the last, 
you know, period of years, you know, relative to, you know, office or retail uh, who, you know, who have experienced some challenges, but, but I think, you know, you still need to, you know, be diversified across the, uh, you know, across the real estate spectrum. Great. Uh, one more question here. Uh, are you not renting to the operators of properties, but actually own and run the assets yourself? Yes, uh, we we typically I, 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 we typically enter into uh, what we call joint ventures with operators, so that we're sharing, you know, the operational risks of the properties. Uh, so that the property does does well, we're we're all sharing in it and. You know, incentives are aligned that way. Uh, we do have some properties where we own a hundred percent, where we'll just have a manager, but we're not doing. I, I think the question was, we're not really doing kind of a triple net, you know, lease situation, where where we're just getting the the rent from the property. Gotcha. A couple more questions still coming in, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep sending them to you. Yeah, go go for it. Go for it. What additional real estate asset classes are you considering for the future? <laughs> Interesting. That's a great question. We've, we've looked at just about everything. Uh, you know, we've, we have made some inroads uh, into what we're calling active adult or senior transitional. If you recall back to uh, my senior housing segment, we think there's an opportunity for people who want to leave their uh you know, kind of family home. They don't want to deal with the uh, repairs, taxes. It's too big for them. But from, you know, kind of that set, you know, maybe late 60s to before 80, you know, before they're ready to go into senior housing, you know, they might like to live in a rental community that has a lot of amenities, uh, is restricted so that you have to be 55 plus to live in there and allows them to kind of you know, sell their home and, and just be a renter, but still live amongst their friends. So we think that's intriguing. Uh, we recently made an investment in uh, this, this might appeal to, you know, folks in Michigan because of all the great uh, recreation opportunities there uh, in a uh, RV campground uh, operator. So it's a, it's a new area for us. We liked, you know, we, we, we liked a couple of things about it. We liked the fact that you know, it appeals across population, but it's a bit of a, it's a bit more of a, a play on aging and retirees. Uh, you know, there's a great need now for recreational opportunities. And, and we certainly saw during the pandemic that, you know, it might be less likely that people are, you know, they certainly still have many, certainly still have money. And this is an affordable way, you know, to get to some really interesting places. Uh, and it's a real stable income, you know, income play for us. So, uh, those are a couple of things that are interesting. I don't know, Melissa, if you have any others that you can think of. No, nothing, nothing more to add in, in that. Area. Okay, but I guess I would add to, we're, we're, we're kind of always looking at them. We've looked at single family rental. Uh, we had been in marinas in the past. We, we're always really looking at everything across the alternative sectors. And, and then we have a dedicated research team at Harrison Street as um, obviously demonstrated by Tom leading and his group is constantly, I think I call it the, the innovation lab, constantly processing new ideas within this demographic needs driven space. So absolutely, I, I feel like there's not a sector that we have not considered and um, we're constantly in motion as it relates to what's next within these non-traditional alternative types. Great. Um do you feel that we are extended in the real estate cycle? Are valuations high? Historically, the cycle is around eight years. Uh, it's, uh, probably a little. Uh, I mean, things are, I guess I would say this, uh, you know, we're seeing that, you know, if, if you think about it from a cap rate perspective, that, you know, things are, are pretty fully priced. Uh, but for quality real estate, uh, and as we go out to sell things, I think we're still we're still experiencing some compression in some areas uh, for really high quality assets and the right markets and the you know, kind of the right asset classes, the right tenancy, uh, because you know we're just we continue to see 
you know, demand in our spaces for people to try and access some of these, uh, some of these segments, which are at times relatively hard to access because, you know, portfolios and our opportunities don't come up all the time. Excellent. Uh, two more questions in about five minutes. So I think that'll about wrap it up. How are funds returned to the investors and how long in the typical is the typical commitment? Thank you. Melissa, I'll leave that one to you, okay? Thanks, Tom. Um, in terms of fund returns, we have two different funds, at least within the US, that I discussed when we first opened our presentation. U.S. Opportunistic Fund, that's a closed-end fund. Um, it's actually a, our current fund that we're working on right now is a 14 to 16% net IRR target, a 1.6 times um, return on equity multiple. Um, and capital is returned over time as we execute our business plans, either develop the properties, execute our value-add business plans, and then sell the properties. As Tom indicated, we typically do this on a single asset basis and then aggregate portfolios. Um, and within our US um, core fund, um, that's focused on investments in stabilized income producing properties um, and generating a, a, you know, a 4%, um, target 4% income return, um, and then just generating that, that consistent income over time with some capital appreciation. I think that I think that pretty much answered the last uh, question. What your target returns uh, uh, for your funds? We we greatly appreciate this opportunity. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you to all the Mapers members that have tuned in today. We Harrison Street's been a member of the organization for the past four years, and we've been honored to take part and and look forward to the opportunity to getting everyone together in person again, hopefully, hopefully soon. Yeah, thank you so much to everyone. Have a great day. We greatly and, appreciate the opportunity. And thank you both Tom and Melissa for a great presentation. And I'd like to thank all our members for joining us today. Earlier this week, we announced the cancellation of our spring conference in May. We remain hopeful that our fall conference scheduled for September in Bay City will go on as planned. Mapers understands the importance of networking and personal relationships. Plans are being made to host two outdoor member networking events this summer. Watch our website and your email for additional webinar offerings and updates on our summer networking events and the fall conference. If you are interested in sponsoring a webinar or have a speaker or topic suggestion, please reach out to the Mapers office. On behalf of the Mapers board, we wish you, your family, and your colleagues good health and safety. Thank you.